the lead negotiator between the Nigerian government and bandits in northern Nigeria, Tukumamu, has been arrested in Cairo, Egypt, alongside members of his family, on his way to Saudi Arabia for lesser Hajj. The State Security Services, SSS, confirmed the arrest of Mamu, who negotiated the release of some of the hostages in the March 2022 train abductions in Kaduna. Mamu last month disclosed that he is pulling out of the negotiations with bandits after alleging threats to his life. His arrest comes a day after Nigeria's Information and Culture Minister, Lai Mohammed, reassured Nigerians that the worst of insecurity in the country is over. Mamu has been arrested several times under previous administrations by security agencies over alleged controversial publications on his platform. He is the media consultant Sheikh Ahmed Gumi, an Islamic cleric, scholar, and former military officer with the rank of captain in Nigeria Defense Academy. Now joining us on the show is Madi Shehu, chairman, dialogue group, and human rights activist, who will also be commenting on national issues in Nigeria. Good morning, Mr. Shehu. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Good morning. Well, uh, Mr. Mamu, let's, uh, Mr. Shehu, let's go straight into it. What do you think of the arrest <coughs> of uh, uh, Mr. Tuko Mamu, publisher of Desert Herald, and uh, media advisor to Sheikh Ahmad uh, Gumi? First, he was inter intercepted in uh, Egypt on his way to Saudi Arabia and repatriated to Nigeria. And the DSS, Department of State Security, has owned up to it to say that, well, they have uh, questions to ask uh, Mr. Tukomamu. Uh, what's your take on all of this? Well, look, my take is that uh, let us look at the modus operandi of the arrest in Egypt. First of all, the Nigerian IMC, they are interested in Mamu. DSS are interested in Mamu. NIA are interested in Mamu. And the Nigerian police are interested in Mamu. Fine. Mamu resides in Kaduna. If the DSS are after Mamu, because they didn't just wake up on Tuesday and said, we've decided to arrest Mamu. They must, be, they must have been trailing him. Now, Mamu's office is just three kilometers away from the DSS office in Kaduna. Mamu's office is four kilometers away from the Nigerian police headquarters, state headquarters in Kaduna. Mamu's office is 3.5 kilometers away from the Nigerian Defense Academy. Therefore, any of these uh, agencies wanting to have Mamu arrested would have done that long, long ago. Why didn't they arrest Mamu in Kaduna in his office? Or send an invitation to Mamu to come for a chat? or send him even a telephone call, they all have his telephone number, call Mamu for a discussion, and then thereby they, they can arrest him. Why did they allow Mamu to travel? They could have also picked him on his way from Kaduna to Kano because they would have been tracking him. They didn't do that. They could have picked him from American International Airport, where all security agents are represented. They didn't do that. Why was it that until he left Nigeria, he left the lost shores of Nigeria, and they, went, they arrested him in Egypt? Now, that is the modus operandi of security agencies worldwide. Let us go on memory lane. Number one, you may recall that uh, Bojilan. Bojilan is a very popular politician in China. He rose from the local level, the lowest level in China's political structure, up to the Chinese, to Chinese Communist Party National Working Committee. He was also most probably a waiting president because of his influence, especially in mobilizing people. He was also very rich. But when there was a scandal in the Chinese Community Party, Communist Party involving billions of Nara, and he started to make noise, they didn't arrest Bo Jilan. The head of Chinese security agency have, has always been attending a meeting along with Bo Jilan, but they decided to allow Bo Jilan to vote to Japan, and they arrested him there. That's number one. Number two, in the, uh, at, the moment, at, 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 time, at a time when there was a crisis of wheat in India, there was uh, a vocal voice called Vaj Rasratnam. He was staying in Delhi. Security agencies saw him as a threat. And they didn't, they didn't arrest him in Delhi. Not until when he boarded to Pakistan, they arrested him in Pakistan. 
Dr. Albert, you will remember that uh, at the time of uh, uh, Dr. Kubo Asairi's uh, famous days, I remember Dr. Abati wrote an article called Dokubo, run, Dokubo, run. Because Abati, Dr. Abati saw how the security agencies were, 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 were caught in Asari. They were bringing him together. They were bringing him closer and closer. And I, I think Dr. Abati, out of wisdom, saw the danger and he told Dokubo, run, Dokubo, run. Dokubo ran to Benin, he was arrested also in Benin. I can continue ad infinitum. You remember Mahmoud Maboub, the head of a uh, 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 Palestinian arm wing. He was known to have been buying arms for self-defense in Israel. Everybody knew him. But instead of the Mossad arresting him inside Israel or at their airport, they followed him to Dubai and they assassinated him in, in, in a hotel. That is the modus operandi of most security agencies in the world. And the DSS are not an exception. So the first question is, why the arrest in Egypt went to Nigeria? I think they wanted to internationalize the crime, alleged crime. They wanted to dehumanize him. They wanted to harass him. They wanted to insult him. And maybe they wanted to paint him in a bad light, a red, blue, maroon colors that are uncomplimentary. I think that is my take for the, for, for the start. Well, I'd like your thoughts then on the reports in today's Daily Trust, in which this is clearly unofficial, an unnamed intelligence source made serious allegations against Tukumamu, including accusing him of being part of a terrorist um, operation out of Sinai in Egypt, and also made some aspersions with regards to collecting two billion naira worth of ransom, effectively what they've described in their paper as ransom racketeering. These are grave allegations, and that, that is the explanation for this arrest. What's your take on that? Well, it remains an allegation. You see, unfortunately, if you look at the British legal system, an accused person is presumed innocent until he is proved guilty. In the French legal system, an accused person is presumed innocent until proven guilty. But it appears that in the Nigerian legal system, an accused person is presumed guilty until proven guilty. Otherwise, we are waiting for details. If Mamu is involved in racketeering of two billion naira ransom, there are enough legal provisions in our legal system to punish him. But making these assertions, releasing this piecemeal information to the public, even before charging Mamu to court, even before arraigning him before a competitive court jurisdiction, creates some doubts and some questions as to the motive behind his arrest. My take is that uh, the arrest of Mamu is an indication of failure of our intelligence community. In a society where the intelligence community, a community is almost confused. You remember that not long ago, before the exit of Lawal Dora, before the exit of uh, uh, Burutai, most of the head of security agencies were not even on talking terms. They were not visibly seeing each other. You know, security agencies have this jealousy, even among themselves. Therefore, for the security agencies to have allowed a civilian like Mamu to get involved, it's an indication that they have failed. Negotiation with bandits, negotiation with criminal gangs is not the responsibility, neither is the speciality of a civilian. Civilians are not trained for that. Security agencies are trained to do that and they are being paid to do that job. But it appears that they have failed woefully to negotiate, to gajol, to arrest, and to do the necessary things to checkmate this uh, illegalities, this crime, high-profile crime in the country, such that people like Mamu and many others abound are reaching out to the criminals with no option. Tell me if the wife of one of the security agencies' head were to be abducted, taken to the bush, I am quite sure that head of security agency would be willing to pay his last cobble to get the wife released, or his son, or his daughter, or his relations. I mean, excuse me, 
If they have failed to do that, should they stop other people from doing that? Like I said, if Mamu is found guilty of collecting money, he should be extended the full wrath of the law. But until then, we will look away from all these insinuations. Make your allegations public. Go to the court. Charge Mamu if you have anything to charge him against. So all of this looks quite very nebulous to us. And Mamu was here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think probably this was about the last real electronic television interview he did. I might be wrong on that, so I won't call it a fact. But he was here. And he expressed concerns about how the relationship had gone. Initially, the relationship was good, <clears throat> but now the relationship has turned sour. Uh, are there other things we needed to know about this relationship? Because it's quite very nebulous. So when those monies were paid, who collected the money? Was it directly the bandits? Or was Mamu as an intermediary? What really happened? And all of this, let's not also forget that Sheikh Gumi has also played an instrumental role, even nominating Mamu to make these conversations. What is really happening here? Yeah, because it's all very convoluted. Yes, Rafael, let me tell you my experience. 27 years ago, on the 7th, between the 7th and the 9th of June 2027, or June uh, 1995, 27 years ago, in Kaduna, when the bashing of Nigerian image was at its own highest peak, the then governor, Lieutenant Colonel Lowell Jafar Isa, he's alive now, and he can confirm what I'm going to tell you now, put up a seminar between Kaduna State Government, New Nigerian Newspapers, and NTE. The seminar was titled, Not in Our Character. All federal government officials were there, state government, security agencies. Matthew Hasaguka delivered a paper there. I also spoke from the floor. The import of the seminar was to deconstruct the image being painted of Nigeria that is so bad. But what is the news there? The news is that uh, after the seminar, after my contribution, a tall, lanky, blue-eyed, blonde hair American guy approached me outside the, 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 the hall at Hassan mm -hmm. Usman in a house, venue of the, of the seminar. He just handed over his card to me, and he left. I looked at the card. What was the name on it? Russell J. Hanks, American Embassy political officer. That was on the 9th of June, 1997, 1995. Not until the 11th of August, I received a call on my landline, and there was a caller ID, and I saw the number. It was Russell's number. He said, Mahdi, I'm just calling as a follow-up to our meeting last time and saying hello to you. Bye-bye. He dropped. Again, on September 9th, he called me again for the same courtesy call. Then on the 11th of December, he called me and said, uh, my dear, I will be coming to Kaduna. Would you want to have a coffee with me? I said, fine. He came in, he called, I met him at Hamdala Hotel. We had a cup of tea. I think he was trying to size me up because he was busy asking me about the performance of Abacha, Abacha's uh, uh, government. And I was playing safe. But then came the big bang on 22nd, 21st December of the same year, he came into Kaduna and he called me. He said, Mahdi, I have a business for you, and it's very important. You meet me at Hamdala Hotel, at the last floor of the Hamdala Motel Wing, which I did. On arrival, Russell Hanks told me, Mahdi, we are worried the American government is doing a bomb campaign against Abacha. We don't want him. We are promoting a regime change. This parcel is what I want you to go. See Doba Hotel just away there, 600 meters. Go into the bookshop and drop this parcel. Small parcel. This is 500,000 Naira for you. And another 500,000 Naira waiting for you. Once you drop the parcel, please come back. You collect the second 500,000 Naira. 
I said, Russell, you have miscalculated. When I addressed Adamu Chiroma as the Minister for Agriculture during that seminar you were referring to, when I addressed Rimi as the Communication Minister, when I addressed Lesamail Isafuntua as the chairman of our newspaper, newspapers for Operation Association of Nigeria, I did that as a citizen, not that because I don't like my country. I dressed him down. I abused him. I said, okay, Mahdi, now I know you're a good citizen. I was just trying to test you. You are nationalistic. We look forward to working with you to stabilize, to stabilize Nigeria. I knew that was an afterthought. But I held him because I saw some desperation in him. He wanted me to leave. I refused to leave. Then I had a knock on the door. Guam, Guam. We went to the door together. Wanting to see me off at the door was a Bagauda Kalfo. The journalist that was being said was killed by the military, was killed by Abacha. Bagauda was right at the door there. I think he gave him an hour before, after me, but I took in, I, 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 I killed into Bagauda's hour. So Bagauda went into the room and I left. What happened? Not long after that, two hours later, bomb, where? Doba Hotel, where? At the bookshop. When that happened, Lord Japan Isa can confirm this. I drove straight to the government house. I wanted to see the governor. For what reason? I see urgent security reason. I was ushered into Lord Japaris Issa's office. And I told him what happened. The following day, I was brought to Abuja. I was able to see Abacha in his residence, and I narrated to him. Before they could say Jack Robinson, four days later, Russell's hang has flo uh, he flew out of Nigeria. Ten days later, security operatives came to Kaduna to interview me. When I gave them the narrative, one of them took me by the side and said, Mahdi, keep off. We are very jealous. Security agencies are very, very jealous institutions. You have done your own. Don't ever give any public comment on it. Don't give interviews. Don't do anything. Because... If you begin to talk, our failure would have been seen very clearly. From this flow of information, I called Mamu three times when he started this negotiation. I said, Mamu, security agencies are more jealous than a housewife whose husband is about to take a second wife. Keep off from them. They will injure you. By the time you get closer, they are parasitic. All security agents in the world have this parasitic nature. A parasite is a living organism, plant or animal, that lives in, on, around a living organism, feed on it, and does some harm to the host. If you allow yourself to continue working with the security agents without caution, they will injure you. They are parasites. They will leave a permanent, irreversible, indelible injury on you. I called him for the first time when I saw him negotiating. After a month, I called Mamu. Mamu, I've seen you posing in pictures with the abductees. He said this. I said, please, keep off. Security agencies, world over, are jealous of civilians getting involved this much because your involvement is an indictment on the security operators in Nigeria because they have failed where you have succeeded. Maybe he didn't hear me. The third time was about a month ago and I called him. Mamu, I have my fear for you. Please, Kindly withdraw. Stop. You have done enough. If you are looking for reward, may God reward you. I have been expecting this arrest long, long ago. In fact, it didn't come to me as a, at all. It never came to me as a surprise. It was a fulfillment of my thought. I thought it was going to come even much, much earlier. Okay, uh, Mr. Shu, let me ask you. <clears throat> Dr. Peter Afunaya the uh, spokesperson of the Department of State Security. In the statement that he issued, he said, yes, all intelligence agencies are interested in having a conversation with uh, Mr. Mamu. But he says, the law will appropriately take its course, whatever they may come up with. Do you trust him making that statement? Well, the law says 48 hours after arrest. So if they have respect for the law, we are looking forward to, after 48 hours, in the next 48 hours, let Mamu be either charged or discharged. 
either charged or released. That is how we can trust them. That is the only way they can build a trust in us. They said the law will take its own course. The first leg of the law is that you don't detain somebody for more than 48 hours. If they have not concluded their investigation, they should charge Mamu to court and then continue with their investigation. But my fear is that uh, they have already let the cat out of the bag. They have begun to release pieces of information enough to cast as passion and to paint Mamu in bad light. Otherwise, they must have been trailing Mamu for long. They must have prepared their charges against Mamu. In a decent, normal society, you find people being charged to court hours after they have been arrested. But I'm not sure if they will be able to charge Mamu by tomorrow. We are looking forward to Mamu being charged by tomorrow. And like I said, Mamu must not be exonerated if he is guilty, if he is involved. Is he, if he's complacent in this issue of ransom taking, he should face the full wrath of the law. But then we should not do a media trial on him. They have released so much information that it is Mamu all over the tabloids, all over the cables, all over the social media. That is enough damage. That is media trial for him. Right, so we await what happens in the next 48 hours. And in the meantime, over 20 Nigerians still languish in captivity just because they took a train from Abuja to Kaduna. But I want you to talk about other issues of national interest. We just spoke with the APC presidential um, campaign spokesperson. What is your take? What are your permutations on the forthcoming elections and the uh, Three horse has been, you know, touted now, race, now that the third force has finally materialized. Yeah, I, I listened to Mr. Bayo Onoluga when he was uh, saying that uh, they are going to have a two-leg uh, campaign. One promoting what uh, Bola Tinubu did in Lagos and the other one of achievements of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the current APC government, uh, Buhari's government. And I was laughing. I said, I was looking forward to Mr. Byron mentioning those achievements. He never mentioned them. He was talking of social investment that people are coming from other countries to copy. What social investments are there? Look, it is very simple and very clear. 2015, APC government came into power. To fight what? To fight corruption. To fight what? To fight insecurity. To fight what? To fight uh, economic uh, crimes. To fight what? To correct the economic are disparities in the society. But you and me, everybody watching this program, knows that they have failed woefully. If you take the issue of security, I mean, I don't need to lecture anybody about how insecure Nigerians are now. Nobody is safe on the highway, any highway, in the workplace, in the industries, in banking halls in primary schools, in secondary schools, in universities, in other tertiary institutions. Nobody is safe. We are much safer before 2015 than we are now. I stand to be corrected. Look at the economic indices in Nigeria. We are much, much poorer now. There are more poor people. When the government said they have lifted 7 million people out of poverty, Clear indicators were that more than 20 people have been sent into permanent economic husbandry. When you talk about trust, we are the most disunited nations now. We are, we are, Nigeria is most disunited now than ever before on account of bad leadership. We have seen promises not fulfilled. So I don't know what Mr. Bayer is saying about the achievement of this regime. They said they are fighting corruption. We are seeing corruption working with its own legs. The most recent one is the Accountant General of the Federation, who was alleged to have stolen 109 billion naira, not by Dr. Ruben Abati didn't do that allegation, neither Hussein nor myself. No, EFCC, a government organ, alleged that a government official have stolen 109 billion naira in his own office. When we calculated, if a public servant is earning a billion naira, a million naira per month, and he keeps that one million naira in safe, in his own safe, and he gets all his daily requirements free, for him 
to save 80 billion naira, he needs to work for 6,664 years to save this much. And one person has stolen that money. The chief of naval staff was on the air. You also saw him. He gave he gave vivid account of the way and manner mother ships were being loaded with stolen crude oil. And by the last calculation, 8.2 trillion naira crude oil is being stolen every 12 calendar month in Nigeria. You can continue issues of uh, corruption in Nigeria under APC ad infinitum such that when APC go out for a campaign, let's say in Kassina, my own state, what do they tell the people of Kassina State? 12 local governments in Kassina State are under siege, under bandits, taking over completely. Unless with a great uh, miracle from God, elections may not hold in those 12 local governments. That is the other leg. The other leg is when you talk about Bola's Tinibu's uh, achievement in Lagos, fantastic. Negotiations can confirm that. But what Nigerians are looking forward to is, before the achievements, the personality of Bola Tinibu. Questions are being raised about his even genealogy, his background, his source of wealth, his educational background. Who are those his classmates in primary school and secondary school? There are so many unanswered questions. Personality is very important. Track record is very important in politics. When you want to preside over a country, you are saying that this is my secret file and my orphan file. Please search. We have searched the secret file of Bola Tinubu, and we are asking, Bola Tinubu, please tell Nigerians, what is the name of the primary school you attended? Who are those your classmates, dead or alive? If you can't remember them, at least you can remember the name of your own headmaster. Who was your headmaster? If you can't remember them, tell us in which town maybe the school had been overrun by reconstructions of, 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 of Lagos State or Ibadan or Yondo. Who are your mates in secondary school? What is the name of the secondary school you attended? Who are they? Who was your mathematics teacher? You said you were a good mathematics, ma ma mathematics student. Who was your mathematics student? Who was your principal? Who are your other teachers? Who are your classmates? Endless questions. We are saying that, please, in the manner you present yourself in public, with tremor at hand, tremor on the leg, instability on the whole body, please tell us, are you mentally and physically health in, healthy enough to preside over Nigeria? Because what we are saying that we are saying some semblance of angina pectoris on you. We are saying some semblance of uh, uh, palpitations in you. We are seeing some semblance of a misturating in you. These are legitimate questions of electors like me to ask. Not just people coming here on the, on the television to say that there is this achievement in Lagos. No, first on the personality. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, Mr. Badi Sheho, I just quickly want to talk about the issue of out-of-school children. In 2019, there was a big argument yes. about the number. Some said it was 10 million. Some said it was... 15 million. But now UNICEF recently said out of school children is 20 million in Nigeria. What's your take on that briefly as we start to wrap things up? My take is it represents a failure of governance, at especially at state levels. Look, in, look at the budgets of most of the northern states. Most of them, most of these out of school children are located in the 19 northern states. So pick a, look, a, a state government budget. You see, 10 billion naira allocated during a financial, during a, during a budgetary year, 10 billion naira allocated as a overhead admin and recurrent cost in a governor's office. Go to the Ministry of Education, you see 1.5 billion naira allocated for education for the whole state. 10 billion naira for administration into what? Into the governor's office. That tells you how myopic that governor is. That tells you if that governor spent all his life telling you that he cares about education, he is nothing but an official personified liar. Look at the visit again. You will see 12 billion naira allocated for what? For traveling expenses. For what? For extra courts. For what? For entertainment of guests. Yet, Go and look at the Ministry for Youth and Sports. 
you will see 800 million naira allocated. The same governor will tell you that he cares about youth empowerment. That is absolute deception in public daylight. I mean, you can continue. 20 million people are telling you that uh, we have 20 million potential Boko Haram, potential kidnappers, potential criminals, potential almajiris, maybe divided in 25% each. Where? In the north. It's a time bomb. It's high time that people hold their governors responsible. I'm not mentioning local governments, even though primary education is under local and local government, because governors have taken over the entire local government structure, first for the finances, secondly for manipulation of their political age. Therefore, 20 million people is more than scandalous enough, and it should give you and me sleepless nights. It means our future and the future of our children it will be under more threat than we are now. Under more uncertainty than we are now. Perhaps it is going to be a continuous harvest of what? Of death. Of death, of what? Of crime. Of what? Of sadness and of melancholy. That is the future. I hope it's going to be avoidable. I hope a new set of futuristic and responsible leaders will emerge where they give education what Awala will give education in the southwest of blessed memory. Okay, Mr. Shew, we have just uh, about two minutes to go. You talked at length about uh, Ashwa Jubala Ahmed Chinumbu. Okay, there are other leading candidates in the 2023 presidential race. We would like to talk very quickly about the presidential candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubakar, and also the candidate yes. of the Labour Party, and what your permutations are in terms of the advantages mm -hmm. across three, four political parties. In the next few, in the next few seconds, I'll tell you, Obi has, do, has done well, but I think 2027 is waiting for him. Konkoso have mobilized between <coughs> Kano and Jigawa. Kudos to him. Atiku is extremely experienced. He's been at the corridors of power. He's not a learner. He's not a beginner. He is the only person who will be given the mantle of leadership today, and he begin to work today. He doesn't need any tutelage. He doesn't have to learn. Number two, he is at home everywhere in the country. Everywhere is home to Atiku. He is not a regional candidate. He is a national candidate with a nationalistic feeling, with Nigeria at heart, and not a zonal or regional bigot. Number three, Atiku has been injured severely over the last 40 years. He healed his injuries silently without making noise. Anybody who has the capacity to heal his injuries silently has the capacity to heal the injuries of the nation of Nigeria. Number four, Atiku understands the global politics. He is somebody who thinks globally and acts locally on so many occasions. I give it to him that uh, given the chance, he is the best among the candidates, he is the best to be trusted, and he is the least injurious. He is not rude, he is not arrogant, he is forgiving. And he has a nationalistic outlook more than any of the candidates. I stand to be corrected. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shew, for joining us on The Morning Show. <laughs>